Tonight on EWT in Life, we'll talk about getting back to our Catholic roots right inside the land. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, and welcome on Father Mitch Packwell, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Tonight, our guest is a Dominican preacher from the western province of the Dominicans, and he's here to discuss getting back to the land through the concept of the Catholic land movement. So please welcome a good old friend of EWTN of mine, Father Emmerich Vogt. Father Emmerich, good to have you back. Thank you. Nice to be Very here. Very nice you. to have you back. Thank you. I know that uh, you've been around, you know, doing some retreats in the area, and it's great to have you here on the show. Thank you. Um, tell us, what have you been up to? Well, now that uh, I'm no longer provincial, I've been back on our preaching band. So we have a group of probably five of us priests who go around give parish missions and retreats to various people. You know, I'd like just to point something out because this is something that a lot of the religious orders have in common. Same with us. You know, when you are the provincial, which is the, the, the ordinary superior of the community, the province, you know, it's not as if after that then you are endowed with yeah. this <laughs> chair where you are perpetually honored. And, you go back to doing the other work. Right. So we had a priest, a wonderful priest, who was provincial. And so he said, you go from being a peacock to a feather duster. <laughs> so now I'm a feather duster. <laughs> and this is, this is a, a good thing. Yeah. You, you wish that a lot of folks who get leadership positions would learn that, yeah, you do your job, Take care of the leadership and get back to the other right, work you right. were doing. Mm -hmm. That's one kind of service. Here's another kind. Get to it. Right. But be that as it may, so you're going around the country. Yeah, so and giving I give missions and retreats. Missions. And actually, I, last summer I went to Australia, which was a great grace. There had been people there. There was a woman who had studied in the United States. And a, as a student, somebody gave her my tapes this was years ago. So she actually introduced my little program to Australia. So we had a big... This is your program on... 12 Steps. 12 Steps. 12 Steps Spirituality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had a big following in Australia. So this family, her family, invited me to come to Australia and they set up all these venues for me to, to speak in and, and I loved it. And there was a big, uh, you know, they have Theology on Tap mm -hmm. and they've got it from us, the Australians. So there was... And, and just so folks know what that is, it's not that you open a spigot and theology comes out. Right. What, what, what's theology on tap? So it's for young adults to meet together, share their Catholic faith, and they meet in a pub. Mm -hmm. And they meet in Australia, in Sydney, they meet on the first Monday of every month, this pub. And they have a speaker come. Mm -hmm. And I met a woman last year when I was giving a mission in Minnesota, and she started a marriage on tap. So married couples, you know, meet together as Catholic couples at a pub and they'll have a simple dinner and they'll have a speaker and they'll share together as Catholic couples. Mm -hmm. So it started for young adults and spread to Australia. So it was wonderful, you know, there in this pub, there was the Dominican bishop, Anthony Fisher and his habit. In which uh, pro, uh, diocese? He's in, oh, I forget the name of the diocese, but it's near Sydney, you know, okay. but okay. it's not Sydney itself. Anthony Fisher, Bishop Anthony Fisher, and uh, so he's in his habit, and the young priest, Dominican priest from the university ch chaplain, he's in his habit. There's four Nashville Dominican sisters in their habit, me and my habit, so a big Dominican night, 400 kids, you know, a big pub, and they're upstairs all around and downstairs, and you know, people come into the pub and not expecting these Catholics to take over the place, so I don't know exactly what they feel about being overwhelmed by all these Catholics all of a sudden, but it's the first Monday of every month, but it, it was wonderful to see all these young people, you know, on fire with their faith and getting together. And then we did the same thing up in uh, Brisbane. We went up there. They had a, mm -hmm. also theology on tap. So 
I was able then to preach at these uh, different venues and take my little 12-step message to these places. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, and then I work with other treatment centers. You know, it is interesting that you're doing the 12 steps of recovery in a bar. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. Or pub to be a yeah. little high class. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But uh, but I like the wisdom of the steps, you know, the, yes. the, the spirituality behind it and the Christianity behind it, which a lot of people are not aware of. It, wasn't there a Jesuit priest yeah, that wonderful helped Jesuit priest. in the writing of the 12 steps? It was Father Dowling was his exactly. name. And he was a good friend with one of the founders, Bill W., Bill Wilson. And actually, Bill Wilson did his confession, his fifth step, non-sacramentally, of course, because he wasn't Catholic, with Father Dowling. Mm -hmm. So Father Dowling was a great influence. There was a wonderful Protestant minister, uh, Father Samuel Shoemaker, an Episcopal priest, who was a great influence. Then there was Sister Ignatia. Yes, yes. Called the Ignatia. Angel of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, so she was a big influence on the beginning of the steps. So all these wonderful Christian influences, and in my opinion, uh, the 12 steps come out of 2,000 years of lived Christian experience. Mm -hmm. And that experience from Christian living was brought by these wonderful Christian people to the founders of the 12 Steps. You know, the, one of the reasons I mentioned Father Dowling, and I'm glad you brought up Sister Ignatia and uh, Reverend Schumacher, is that a number of folks who have various addictions like alcoholism or um, uh, drug use, sexual addictions, food addictions. I mean, it, it's useful f for a lot of behaviors that become what St. Thomas Aquinas would call a habit. Mm -hmm. That you know you are you're, you're just in this right. habit that you cannot break right. by yourself. And the twelve steps brings it into small chunks, mm -hmm. so you can take one small chunk at a time. But a lot of times the folks in the 12 steps have this anti-church, sometimes anti-Christian, as God, as, I can, as you conceive him, is the way they put it, because they want it open to Jews, Muslims, right. Catholics, Protestants, everybody. But then it almost seems as that some people in the 12 steps think they have to come up with their own God. Mm -hmm. that they can see their own God, and they get angry at the church, angry at the, the, the you know, God of Scripture and so on, and they, they blame God, mm -hmm. which you know, is so odd since the steps came from right. that Christian root. Right, and so if you look at the founders and you look at the literature, you look at the AA Big Book, and it all talks about God. They have the prayer of St. Francis mm -hmm. that they use. And Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi. And they have a book called 12 by 12, 12 Steps, 12 Traditions. And in there, the alcoholic is encouraged to inventory the seven deadly sins in their lives. Mm -hmm. So these are the Judeo-Christian foundation of the steps, morally speaking. Mm -hmm. But since we live in a, in a more and more anti-Christian culture, it's going to manifest itself in these meetings, you know. Mm -hmm. But if they stick to their founders, the founders of the 12-step movement, it's uh, highly Christian and God is spoken of all the time. Yeah, and you know, these, this is something that is uh, extremely important. And the, the Christianity of the 12 steps shows up at the very beginning. First step is? I'm powerless. So yeah. St. Paul in Romans 7, the right. good I want to do, I don't do. Right. The evil I don't want to do, I do. I can will what's right, but I can't do it, right? right? So we're powerless. So as I see the 12 steps, the first step is about being powerless. Then the next of all the rest of the steps are about inviting a power into your life that is bigger than you are. Well, see, and that's one of the keys. You know, the, the second step is to say what? Second step is to say there's a power greater than me outside of me, bigger than me, that can help me, that can mm -hmm. restore me to, in, to sanity. And, and also that that power is stronger. You know, it's, a, it's an act of intellectual faith. That's my power is stronger than my addiction. Right. You know, that, 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 that this greater power, God, is more powerful than my sexuality, my uh, drinking, my drugs. Right. He's, he is, and that's an intellectual act of faith that leads to the third step, which is? Third step is made a decision 
to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. So God cares about us. And I think that's something that people forget, you know, that God is a caring, merciful person. So I tell people, you know, if you look at Christ, and Christ is beaten up, spit on, crucified, and then he rises from the dead. And the first thing out of his mouth is peace be with you, he says to his apostles. And they're scared to death. They're locked behind doors. Are they afraid of the Romans? No. They're afraid of their own, uh, the boogeyman? No. They're afraid of their own people and they're locked away in fear. So here's the Lord, been treated like this, deserted by them, and he doesn't bawl them out. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. So, I mean, how loving can you be? He doesn't yell at them, bawl them out for deserting him, Peter for denying him. Peace be with you. So I tell people, if you look in Scripture, there's only two people, I believe, that Jesus ever calls friends. And one is Lazarus. Like, yeah, well, that makes sense. It's, scripture says he loved Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Tells how he spent many a Sunday at their house watching the game, having pizza. So, friend. Jews can't eat pizza. They can't? You can't put any sausage on it anyway. No, right. <laughs> no meat and, yeah. and cheese. Yeah. Anyway, go on. <laughs> and then the second person that Jesus calls friend is Judas. And when does he call Judas friend? The moment that Judas comes to betray him. And so my understanding of that text is the mercy of God, always ready to hold out the hand of reconciliation, no matter what. You can cut yourself off. You can self-destruct like Judas, but God will never cut us off. So how beautiful is God, you know? So uh, that's the kind of care I'm surrendering to in step three. I made a decision to turn my will and my life over the care of God. So whatever a person's recovering from, and it can be anything because uh, I was talking to uh, a drug addict recently who's a recovered drug addict, but his parents, you know, back home, don't think they have any addictions and they spend the whole day on the internet. You know, so people get addicted to shopping, to the internet, to money, to drugs, sure, to sure. so, and that's why the 12 steps have expanded. Started off with alcoholism, but then the spouses of the alcoholic realize, well, you know, we got problems too. Mm -hmm. Harder to see their problems than it is the alcoholics, but they realize they had problems. So Al-Anon begins. Yeah, and, and even in Al-Anon, they also have to admit, we're powerless mm -hmm. over alcohol in my spouse. Right that they, they, sometimes they try to fix what they can't fix. Right. So that, and, that's, and that's where they have to go for, for themselves. And I think that um, the 12 steps, I think the as Catholics, we could say that the first step is, I'm powerless over the effects of sin in my life. Original sin, my personal sins, and I have no power to heal that. I need a healing source that's outside of myself, greater than myself. So it's thoroughly Christian. You can't save yourself. And we are all powerless over the effects of sin in our life. Right. Personal sin and um, original sin. We're wounded people. We've got temptations of lust and anger and envy, all the seven deadly sins. And that's why the alcoholic was taught in the 12 by 12 to inventory sin in his life because there's a connection between my addiction, my uh, crazy behavior, and sin. And I've got to inventory that if I want to be a healthy person. And I think also as part of that, you know, the, it's key for everybody may, going through these steps to realize it's not just something that society doesn't approve of. It's really sin, an offense against God that damages my human nature, that damages the image and likeness of God within me. Right, and therefore people are not free to love. As St. Augustine says, if you love iniquity, you don't love yourself. And self-love is a part of the gospel call, right? To love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love and care for yourself, then it, you may think you're loving another person, but it's not love. So you'll hear it said in the 12-step movement, for example, that it's very common for the health care professional to marry into an alcoholic family. So I'm preparing a couple for marriage. You know, they're 21 years old, and they think it's love that brought them together. But as one wise elderly woman said to me one time, Father, it's pathology seeks pathology. So the nurse, so I'm preparing this couple for marriage and I find out this young girl, 21 years old, is a nursing student. So I thought, who's she gonna fix? You know, so I look at this young man, do you know what you're in for? You know, but anyway, I thought, well, it can't be all nurses, right? So we go along in the marriage program. I find out he's from an alcoholic family. And I was shocked, here's the nurse marrying at the alcoholic family. 
So we go on in the program and they fill out these various forms to help us uh, prepare for marriage. One of the questions, are you concerned about the drinking of your future spouse? She checks off, yes. They're not even married yet and the nursing student marrying into the alcoholic family is concerned about his drinking. So I said to him, do you have a drinking problem? I said, I don't have a drinking problem. You know, my father's an alcoholic. I, I like a couple of beers at night, but I have a drinking problem. Oh, you have to have an addictive substance. It's not like, yeah, you know, I have to have a couple of uh, warm milks at night, but a couple of beer, addictive substance. After a while, two beers is not going to give you the buzz it used to give you. You have to increase the dose. You're from an alcoholic family, and you're marrying a nurse. But I couldn't believe it, you know. But they think it's love that brought them together. Mm -hmm. So there's where persons get deeper insights into themselves, like the nurse. Why are you marrying the alcoholic? Because some people confuse being needed with being loved. I met a doctor one time. His wife, he tells us in tears, wife taken to the emergency room, drug addict. He said, I realize I can't save her. But he is the doctor. Somehow he became a doctor because of this need to help and fix and feel good about yourself. I'll fix somebody. <clears throat> so that's where the codependent, the Al Anon type, the person married to the addict, doesn't realize that they have problems. It's easy to see the alcoholic exactly. or drug addict has problems, but not themselves. And how, you know, th th there's oftentimes they speak of a codependency mm -hmm. that the non alcoholic partner becomes, d does a lot of obnoxious behavior, not only toward the alcoholic, but toward the other members of the family, the children right. and so on, and tries to become controlling of everybody right. in that codependent way. Right, and, and so they, they need to they need to realize I'm powerless. Right, and God, but God is not powerless. And so, like last week's gospel, I think it was last Sunday was, you know, take the beam out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your. But our first thing is to look there for the problem and not see the problem here. We don't see the problem here, although Christ tries to tell us to look here for the problem, and we try to fix other people, and we don't have that kind of power. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, you see so much more more dysfunction in our culture. And the good part about it is people who want to be saved from that dysfunction are going to have to learn the wisdom that you find in the 12 steps one way or another. So Viktor Frankl, do you remember Viktor oh, Frankl? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, Man's Search for Meaning. Man's Search for Meaning. One of the most wonderful books of the 20th century, yeah. I think. So as a psychiatrist in a concentration camp, he noted that it was those people who lost their hold over moral, and spiritual values, who were the ones who fell victim to the dehumanizing effects of the camps. And so that's my argument for why we see so much insanity in our culture. So recently, there's a man arrested, murdered his five children, ages one to eight. Mm -hmm. And then before that, a man, for spite, because his wife divorcing him, he gave rat poison to the little girl, drowned the little boy in spite against his wife. People show up at school and shoot people. Mm -hmm. Serial killers, mom killers, child killers. Why so much insanity and all the time? Somebody's body, is, somebody disappeared. They found her body. Little girl disappeared up in Bremerton, Washington. They finally found her body. And why so much insanity? And my argument would be Viktor Frankl's argument. If you're not trained in moral and spiritual values, which protect you, right? You build up moral and spiritual antibodies, so to speak, to protect ourselves from the poison of sin. And we, we have inside the culture a certain fear of religion that not only shows up in the 12 step groups, but in general, where parents will say, I won't teach my children anything about religion. And then when they're 18, they can choose on their own. Mm -hmm. But that's like not giving them nourishing food mm -hmm. all they're growing up and saying, well, they'll, they'll, they'll get their own antibodies to various diseases right. when they turn 18. No, you start them, mm -hmm. you know, with their mother's milk right. that's filled with antibodies right. and you nourish them well all along the way. And the same thing with spirituality, that this, you know, teaching them morality and uh, the, the Christian faith is an antibody to these terrible influences. Right, so when parents don't do that for their children, and you see it all the time when you go to the airport, right, where these children, the parents have no control over them.
for example, I was at the airport, and they have these black things to make lanes, you know, they attach. Well, this little boy's running through, getting rid of all of them. Father's running after him. The father picks him up. He's kicking his father and says, put me down, you idiot, to his father. So, now children. You know, that, that was a phrase I don't ever recall thinking. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, without considering a plate of dead meat. Yes, right. <laughs> that, that, would, that would be unacceptable. Now, recently, you know, at the airport, here's this little boy screaming and yelling, carrying on. He wanted something his mother wouldn't give him. And she dropped the um, boarding passes. He stepped all over them. And then finally he slaps his mother, and then she gave him what he wanted. So how is that child going to grow up and say no to drugs and sex and so forth? So in the news recently, there were a couple of boys who brought knives to school to kill this girl who made them angry. Luckily, some other boy got wind of it and turned them in. Just like in California recently, before the start of the school year, some boys were planning a massacre at their school. But some right. other child got a wind of it and turned them in. But why all this insanity? If children do not grow up with moral and spiritual antibodies, they have no protection against their own frustration, their own anger, their own lust, our own woundedness. Yeah. And so they and, need healing. You know, one of the, you know, we talked about the first three steps, but they know that fourth step is also something that, you know, needs to be developed. Without the spiritual antibodies that you're talking about, the fourth step, which is to to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of our lives. And those two terms, searching and fearless, mm -hmm. those are very key because a lot of people in our society are afraid to search deeply mm -hmm. and fearlessly. Right. They're afraid to own up to their own responsibility and call bad behavior bad. And I think it's like Adam and Eve sin, and they're full of shame. And so we're victims of our original sin. We're wounded people, and we've got our own sinful past, and we're full of shame. So we're going to cover our shame somehow, like Adam and Eve tried to do it. Uh, the Tower of Babel people try to do it with their exploits and stuff. So we try to cover up our shame. A bully meets out his shame by attacking other people. Maybe he attacks his wife. Well, this house is a mess. What have you been doing all day? and make her full of shame, because that's how bullies meet out their shame. Mm -hmm. so, um, so a person has to come then to healing. And healing takes place, as Jesus says, where two or three are gathered. Mm -hmm. Why two or three? Because we are created in the image of God, and God is not solitude and closed upon itself, but God is a trinity of persons. To be a person is to exist in relationship with other persons. Personality expresses itself in altruism, reaching out to others, and people relating back to you, which tells us that alienation creates a mental health crisis if people remain alienated long enough. So you meet people uh, like the killer in Connecticut, that boy who killed, what, 22 people or something right. at his elementary school. Right. And his own mother. Yeah, and his own mother. Yeah. And so, and there's the problem with where's the father? Well, the father's living off somewhere else. So recently there was, you know, a boy that committed suicide because he was bullied at school. And so then the father gets angry, you know, and he's angry about it. And where's the law that's supposed to protect and the schools are supposed to protect our children? But what's the real problem, in my opinion? You read in the next paragraph how he found out that his son committed suicide because the wife called him up and said that the boy, 15 years old, committed suicide because he was bullied at school and shot himself with her boyfriend's gun. Mm -hmm. So the father's living in another state with somebody else. She's living with her new boyfriend and the child. And so, because I began to wonder, what, why commit suicide? Because you're bullied. There were bullies when we were kids, but we were taught to say, you know, I'm rubber, you're glue. Everything bounces off me and sticks to you, and then you run like mad, you know. <laughs> Unless now, you're big enough to fight them back. Yeah. <laughs> and so they can't, but they can't deal with problems because there's no moral and spiritual antibodies that have been built up. And a, and a life of self-denial, but rather self-indulgence, give your kids everything, and then problems and troubles in life, and they can't cope. And, and that would be in some communities, but other communities, uh, there's also the uh, other extreme. It's not that they give their kids everything. That would be middle and upper middle class folks. But there's also in the poor classes that where um, they don't give them anything. Fathers abandon the women and children. Mm -hmm. 
and there's not much to give. Uh, and and they, there's and kids have this profound rejection by the father. And now, when they're drug addicted mothers as well as fathers, neither parent is there, and grandparents right. are raising. So there's also this other kind. There, there's some who are spoiled. That would be the kind you see in the airports because they have enough money for an airplane ticket. Yeah. But there are those who don't have enough money for a bus pass. Right. And, you know, they are deprived. Mm -hmm. and, but the effect is still as negative. Yeah. No, in either case. And, you know, Dr. Vitz wrote a book called Faith of the Fatherless. Pa Dr. Paul Vitz. Vitz, yeah. yes. Faith of the Fatherless. And his thesis is, if you look at... Um, prominent atheists throughout history, not just modern atheists, but throughout history, what you find is either an absent father or a terrible father. Mm -hmm. And so he sees as the root of a lot of atheists this problem of being fatherless or having an absent father or a father was horrible. Mm -hmm. So like when I was a kid growing up in public schools, we used to pray every day yes, in public school. I went to public school in the mm -hmm. 50s. And uh, we, we, we could pray and read a little scripture. Yeah. And in, uh, in junior high school, Catholics got out half day for, uh, for CCD. Mm -hmm. Protestants stayed in school for manners and morals. People were taught the Ten Commandments, which is against the law now. Yes. So they grew up with some moral foundation. Uh, the, the commandments aren't against the law, but teaching the commandments right. is against the law. <laughs> right. yes. yes. So and then, of course, Madeline Murray O'Hare, you know, got uh, uh, prayer out of the public schools. But her son writes how, as a child, you know, we can never get together as a family because of my mother's hatred for her father. So that's Dr. Vitz's argument that behind a lot of atheism is this problem with the father figure. And it, I al always like to point out that within five years of the prohibition of prayer in schools and the reading scripture, in the Chicago government school system, they installed metal detectors because of the weapons being brought into school. They removed the doors off bathroom stalls mm -hmm. because of the drug dealing, rapes, uh, uh, and, and physical assaults going on. And somehow I think the Bible was better. Yeah, right. And I went back to my school back in Connecticut, you know, and I was shocked to see out of our school all this graffiti all over the place. So when we were young, there was no graffiti. Yeah. You know, so. So the steps, but I like the fact that then a person to recover, they have to inventory um, moral issues in their life and be open and honest about them. But what makes it difficult is because of the shame. Yeah. So to have to be able to face myself, see, a person's full of shame. But you, if they go to a meeting, an alcoholic goes to an A meeting, full of shame, and now he's got to go without his drug, and he's never dealt with his negative feelings that he has, so he's scared to death to go. But after a while, he loses his fear, people are good to him, he finds fellowship, then he's able to stand up and say, hi, my name is John, and I'm an alcoholic, shame-free. And that comes from a social setting. Why? Because we are created in the image of God, and God is a trinity of persons. To be a person is to exist in relationship with other persons. But isolation creates a mental health crisis. If a person's isolated enough, it's unhealthy because we are created as persons to exist in relationship with other persons. We have to take a little break. We're going to come back in just a couple minutes and continue on with our discussion with Father Emmerich. So please stay with us.
Thank you. Welcome back. First, I want to invite you to come and be here with us and be part of our studio audience. If you can do so, please contact our pilgrimage department. The phone number for them is 205-271-2966, or you can go to the website EWTN.com. They'll give you information about the different places you can stay and eat, also scheduling of programs that you can be in the audience for, scheduling of the masses, as well as uh, directions on how to get up to the shrine of the most blessed sacrament of enhanced form. Well, Father Everett, I want to talk to you. You wrote a book. It's called Freedom to Love, correct? Right. Yeah, um, uh, Recovery in the Seven Deadly Sins. Now, you've been, does some of what you've been saying play into that book? Yes, it does. I was actually, after being provincial, they let you go on sabbatical. Mm -hmm. So I went on sabbatical and I was chaplain to our cloistered nuns in Hollywood. Okay. We have cloistered nuns in Hollywood. That Hollywood sign up on the hill? Yes. Well, as you head up that hill, the nuns' monastery is there. So are they pray for some of those people they down are. at the bottom of the hill? Yes, and on, as the hill goes up, the nuns have this huge, beautiful white statue of Jesus overlooking Hollywood Boulevard, you know, and there's Jesus. And they light it up at night. Good for them. So I was I their like chaplain it. for a year and I loved it. Yeah. I loved living in Hollywood. I helped out at this parish in Hollywood. And where a lot of people who work in the industry go, you know, a lot of sure. Catholics who, and they go to church at this church in Hollywood. Which church is that? St. Victor's. St. Victor's. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, so that's where I, I started. And I love to study, you know, and I love to, I'm not very bright, but I do love to study. And I, so, but I wanted to write a book and it's called The Freedom to Love, that if people want to love rightly, then they have to deal with the seven deadly sins in their lives. So that's why the subtitle is Recovery and the Seven Deadly Sins. And when I speak of recovery, though, I'm not speaking of recovery from alcoholism purely and simply or gambling, but rather in the wider Christian sense of recovery from the effects of sin in our life. Original mm. sin, we're born wounded, and we have our own sinful past, and these have a debilitating effect on us, and we need right. the life of grace. So we need to be aware of those in our lives. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, this, um, you know, is something that, you know, I, I know you bring into the retreats that you give on the 12 step and spirituality. Mm -hmm. That this is something that you very much include. You know, we, we talked uh, up to the break about the fourth step that uh, searching and fearless examination of your life. Mm -hmm. Now, this, that's only four steps. What would be the next step for somebody? If you've, if you've done this searching and fearless moral inventory where you're not afraid to own up to what you've done and to your responsibility for doing it, then what do you do? And what makes you fearless, of course, is the fact that if you go into to a meeting, like an AA meeting, and you get to be able to reveal yourself and talk to your, about yourself and how you feel, and you become more and more comfortable with your broken self, and don't have to cover your shame anymore. So then the next step then is... And, and, well, let me just interrupt you there. Part of that growth in fearlessness is that these other people have already moved farther along. They're fearless mm -hmm. in sharing their own vulnerabilities. Right. And that's healing in itself. Right. People go and they share their experience, strength, and hope in a meeting. And if that becomes hope for you, you hear these people and um, like I met a man who was arrested for stalking women, you know, and he was a young married man and so of course full of shame, it's in the newspaper and his wife's family thinks he's a total loser, so full of shame and self-loathing. But then he gets into a 12-step program for lust addiction called SA, Sexaholics Anonymous. I see him a year after that and he's full of life, he's happy going to meetings, he's met people who have had his problem, his addiction, or worse, and they've overcome it, and they're a sign of hope for him and offer him fellowship. So that's where the healing comes from, from a social setting. Like Jean Vanier, mm -hmm. Jean Vanier, a Catholic Canadian who started communities for mentally handicapped people, and he wrote a book, From Brokenness to Community, wherein he says that a one-to-one -one situation is not a good situation. It's important to bring broken people into a community 
a community of love where then they find their self-worth, you know? So that takes away the shame and become fearless. Now I can look at myself then, because people love me. They know my issues, they love me. So I can take more and more an honest look at myself and because people are not going to hate me because and they've done what I've done or worse. And so there's fellowship and healing in the fellowship. Then the next step would be step five where for the Catholic, of course, we take our inventory. Now we've got to go confess it. That's exactly what this step is, to go to a spiritual director, a sponsor. Uh, we have a retreat house um, in my province where a lot of AAs come and use our retreat house. They'll have to do a fifth step. Well, our priests are there. These people are not Catholic, but they know that priests are used to confession. And so they'll come and do their confession, their fifth step with the priest there. Because, you know, part of it is it's not only enough to say, um, you know, to yourself, but to say it to God and another individual human being forces you to put it into words. It's not merely a thought. Right. But it's actually speaking it out loud and owning up that responsibility in a semi-public but trusting right. kind of way. And fooling ourselves has been the pattern of our life. Mm -hmm. So you need, you need some objective source who understands it to be able to see that because you know from confessions that people come to confession and they'll confess things that are not sins in themselves and they don't know it like maybe they'll confess their feelings and there's right. no moral value to how they feel but what do you do about it mm -hmm. and then there's something serious in their life that they don't see as serious so they need some sounding board to pass it off with because fooling it being blind to themselves one of the major effects of original sin is being blind, you know, to our, so to sharing it with somebody that can help you see through it and see more deeply as you share what you discovered about yourself in step four. So it, it, it brings greater perspective mm -hmm. on it from somebody who has a lot of experience. Right, right, right. And this is something that uh, is a, a very important step. Um, again, we see a lot of Catholics, so it's changing. As I travel around the country, I see that when priests do make themselves available for confession, but also preach about it, that people do come. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't make yourself available, if you don't talk about it and preach why confession is important, mm -hmm. then you might not get so many. But when you talk about it, uh, treat, right. And if the parish says, so if you want a confession, make an appointment, well, that's not good enough. You know, I mean, pe people want to keep their anonymity, which they have a right to. Exactly. And then if they know the priest is there, they can come in and go to confession. They're free to come. He doesn't have to know who you are. You don't have to know, who, you know, and then um, the availability, if the priest makes it available, people come, mm -hmm. like you exactly. said. Yeah. So that's the, that's the spirit of step five, which I'm sure comes from, again, 2,000 years of lived Christian experience. It's not enough to keep it to yourself. I did one time many years ago go to the hospital to anoint somebody, and there was this fundamentalist Christian minister there, and he came over to argue with me about something. I thought it, I was going to have to defend purgatory yet again, but it wasn't purgatory. He came over to tell me that he goes to confession. And he says, there's my confessor. God is my confessor. I go to God. So, well, what's wrong with this picture? It's not about you and God. You know, why did Jesus start a church? Why did he take this sacrament, do this in memory of me, go baptize all nations? So I'd have to say to him, well, who baptized you? Were you baptized by the man upstairs? That's my confessor, the man upstairs, he says. No, he, if he was really baptized, it was real water with real hands and a real voice that he heard. Right. So it's too simplistic to say it's, it's not about me and God, right? It's about me and the community. And that's how one finds healing. And that's what... Um, Jean Vanier's argument is from brokenness to community. You find healing in community. I, I remember one convert who said to me, you know, I, I, she had tried a number of denominations, and she said, everybody told me to confess my sins, and I did. I had no problem with that, but nobody told me, go in peace, your sins are forgiven, until I became a Catholic. Mm -hmm. So she confessed, but she didn't hear those words. And that became one of her greatest sources of consolation, mm -hmm. that the priest could say, I absolve you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
go forth in peace yeah. and sin no more. And there's a saying in the 12 steps that we're only as sick as our secrets, right? Sick people have secrets. And so by being able to confess, there's a big burden off of you by confessing your sins. And it's a great relief. It's healing, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why we have that sacrament. Yeah. So now, so then what after you confess your sins, oh, that's fit, you're all done, right? <laughs> Then that leads you on to step six, which is um, preparing yourself for God to remove your crazy behavior. So we want to we wanna prepare ourselves to be able to change. So it's not enough to go to confession, but I have to make a firm purpose of amendment. Right. So I've got to change and stuff like that. So I want to prepare myself for God to remove my defects. So that's step six. But see, but seven. one of the things about the way you put that is I think is very important. It, you're, not, you're not saying, oh, I'm going to go change myself. That's not what you're saying, right. is it? No. The sixth step is more about preparing myself that God can change me. Right. I need that grace of God right. to make the change. Right. And St. John the Cross warns when he speaks about step six is that our trying to do it on our own. See, and so it's like St. Paul perhaps saying, you know, he had a thorn in the flesh an angel is Satan to keep me from getting proud. So three times he prays, Lord, take this away, you know, take it away, you know. And finally, after the third time, she says, no, stay close to me. I'll give you the grace yeah. not to act out of your woundedness. So it's like the alcoholic, you know. Stay because, yeah, because when you're weak, then I'm strong. Yeah. The Lord is saying to him. Yeah. yeah. So like the alcoholic, you know, I'm not going to take away your alcohol addiction. It's an addiction you have for whatever reason. Stay close to me and I'll give you the grace never to take another drink. So step six and seven are about preparing oneself to ask God, humbly ask God, step seven, humbly ask God. So the whole focus is on humility. So St. Teresa of Avila, when she talks about the spiritual life, the prayer life, you want a real prayer life, the primary virtue that must be practiced by those who pray is humility. The primary virtue. Isn't love the primary virtue? No, because arrogant, self-centered people can't love properly. So step seven, all about humility. And so St. John the Cross warns about people wanting to do it themselves. Being self-righteous is not going to work. Or I'll meet people, maybe they had a lust problem. They have not had a lust problem for years. All of a sudden their lust problem comes back. Why? The saints tell us either they took credit for it, and therefore they slip back into it, or they judge other people, and they slip back into it. That's, uh, and I think, uh, let to take a look at those two aspects of humility. You know, because uh, the, starting with the judging other people. Oh, can you believe how, what that hussy is doing on that show? <laughs> and, and I always think of, you know, some people think of pride as putting yourself down. Mm -hmm. But I think of pride as changing your gaze instead of looking up at God and realizing how teeny, tiny, small you are. You start looking down on other people, say, look at that one down there, look at that. Mm -hmm. that that's very key. Yeah, so they have an expression that I like. It says, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Yeah, good, great So there's way to two put sides it. to the pride coin. People pride themselves, you know, I have two degrees. I went to the University of Ta Da Da, like you knitted your brain together, you know. So St. Paul says, what do you have that you haven't received? So there's that source of pride. And then there's uh, people who say, well, I'm no good. I can't do anything. I'm, and that's pride, you know. It isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's not about you. It's about God. Yeah, it's about God. And it's, other people have got problems. Like I met a man, supposed to be a Catholic man, married with children who are afraid of their Catholic father because he's got an anger problem. He's driving on the highway, and some woman cut him off. She cut him off. And then she turned around and she flipped him, the Hawaiian sign of good luck. Yeah. And he was furious, so he chases after Still her. in Hawaii? <laughs> <laughs> so he chases after her to return the sign. And he's Catholic. So there's where the arrogant person thinks it's about them. It's not about you. This woman's having a bad day. The mature person, Christian, could say, honey, kids, this poor woman probably lost her job today. Let's say a prayer for her that God will take her home safely tonight. Well, that's one of the reasons I tell people to say a rosary when you're driving. Mm -hmm. It's a lot better thing to do with your hands <laughs> than all the other people are doing with their hands as right. they drive. Yeah, and it's so odd because the person who makes a mistake in the traffic and they get angry at you, 
well, haven't they ever made a mistake? And the, they have. But yeah. somehow when you do it, it's worse than when I do it, you know. So this humility, the whole focus in step six and step seven is about humility. Humbly ask God to remove my faults, my defects of character. Right. Right. So, but I have to demonstrate on an ongoing basis my willingness then to let God reform me. I can't go back to my old way of behaving and expect mm -hmm. God to remove all this. I got to cooperate with his grace for him to remove. You know, one of the things I also know in terms of that humbly asking God, uh, a behavior I see taking place in a lot of public places is folks become extremely demanding of the people working there. You know, again, stewardesses. Stewardess, there's not enough mm -hmm. of the, the, the drink or the peanuts, whatever it is, and get those over here. You know, and, mm -hmm. and there's this demanding quality. Yeah, and it's horrifying anything, when Christians do it, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's bad when anybody, uh, it just, you know, uh, I, I see stewardesses, you know, who are so apologetic for, you know, what the plane's gonna be like. I said, you know, ma'am, I know you didn't do it. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, same thing with a, a restaurant or a store or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we're out of something, they're afraid someone's gonna yell at them. Yeah. And it's, that's an arrogant demanding that I think some people carry over to God. Yeah. You do this for me now. Yes. You're God, you're almighty, get it done. Yeah. This is not the humble asking. No, it's not. So humility, so to anytime we can eat humility, eat hum humble pie, as they say, we should take the advantage of doing it. If somebody says to you, uh, go close that door, you idiot. You left the door open. You didn't leave it over. Go close the door. What's the big deal? It's a door, you know, <laughs> but, but you're dying to yourself, you know, but we want to justify ourselves because inside a little weak boy who hasn't matured and is still harboring anger and all these issues that we need healing and that's what these steps bring about. Right. Now, so you humbly ask, then what do you do? So then, you know, I think a lot of people, a lot of Catholics, you go to confession. There's an old saying, you know, Mr. Business went to Mass, he never missed a Sunday. Mr. Business went to hell for what he did on Monday. So I've, part of confession is making a firm purpose of amendment. All right, so I've got to amend my life. So steps eight and nine are about looking at people, situations where harm has come to people of what I've done in the past, and I've got to make amends. So step eight is about making a list of people where real harm has come to somebody because of what I've did. And I've never um, repaired mm -hmm. that damage. Not like for instance, stealing something. Stealing somebody. something, yes. Then go ahead and pay so, it back. Yeah, you can go to confession. You confess you're stealing, but is that it? No, I've got to repair the damage I've done. I've got to repair what I've stolen. If I can't give it to the person directly, then I have to give it to the poor. Somehow I have to make restitution. That's part of taking responsibility for my behavior. So confession, right, doesn't take away the... Uh, the need to do restitution. Right, the need yeah. to repair the damage I've done. It's like if I'm playing ball with my kids in the backyard on Saturday morning, the ball goes through your window. I thought, oh, I'm responsible. I've got to go and say I'm sorry and so forth. But if I go back next Saturday, do it again, next Saturday, do it again, I come to you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, you're not sorry. I have to make a firm purpose of amendment. So the same thing with the sacrament. If somebody says, gee, my son's making his first communion on Sunday, my wife and I will go to confession, we'll go to First Communion as a family, or go to communion as a family on Sunday. He goes back to his mistress on Monday. He wasn't forgiven on Saturday. No. Even if the priest absolved him, thinking he's sincere, if you don't have a firm purpose to change, then it's not Catholic voodoo like right. some people would accuse us of. You have to have mm -hmm. a firm purpose of amendment. Right, if, you, if you're confessing pornography, you need to throw away into the right. books or magazines. You have to put blocks on your computer to, yes. so, to stop them from coming and take these steps. Right. And so I, you take the step then of playing ball. Say, this isn't working, kids. So we've got to go down to the park and play ball. So now I go to you. I apologize for the broken window. We're changing our behavior, going to the park. So I'm forgiven. You're forgiven. You see, I'm, I'm sincere. But is that it? No, I got to repair the damage to your window. Right. So confession doesn't repair windows. So I've got to take responsibility to make reparation, acts of reparation to repair the damage of my sins. Right. So step eight is about making a list of people where harm has come to them because of what I did. So I make a list and see where my mind takes me. 
Then get to step nine. Now I've got to make those amends. I've got to go to the person and uh, take responsibility for what happened. So, uh, but there's a nice codicil there. So long as it doesn't do harm to that person by me trying to undo right. the harm I or did. Or third parties. Or third parties. So for example, one time this woman shows up at this woman's house and she apologizes for having an affair with the woman's husband. That's not step That's nine. No, 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 you no, don't no. harm third parties because of something you've done. So it takes prudence and it takes a uh, counseling from a sponsor or a priest or your spiritual director to see if it's the appropriate time, it's not the appropriate time or how to say it. So. Wisdom. And that, so you, you, you make those amends and then you're all done? And then, so what next is what one of our priests calls temple maintenance. So, okay, you've cleaned out the temple, like it says in scripture, but is that it? If it's not it, then seven demons worse come and take up residence in the clean temple. So I've got to have a daily spiritual life. And it's something that's always step 10 is something that's always been a part of religious life. We take an examination of conscience at night prayer every night. We look at the day, where do things go well, where didn't they go well, and when we're wrong, promptly admitted it, it says. So made a daily inventory, daily examination of conscience, and when we're wrong, promptly admitted it. Right. So that, but we take responsibility now for ourselves, despite what other people's involvement is in the issue, I take responsibility for my unchristian behavior. So for example, one time I was living with a priest who was sort of a bully, you know, inside's the little boy who, well, he's a bully and stuff like that. But one time I challenged his bulliness in an ugly way. I know it's hard to believe that I would do something like that. Huh? I can't believe it. Yeah, so. I would do that, <laughs> you at least guy. So, but I didn't mean it. It was at a community meeting and I didn't mean it, but you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah, yeah. I'm still responsible for it. And luckily with my 12-step experience and realizing this, formerly I'd blame him. He's a bully, why should I apologize? But no, that's unchristian. I have to take responsibility for it. So I go to his room, step 10, when we're wrong, promptly admit it. So I go to his room and I knock on the door, you know, my heart is beating, knock, knock, knock. And I started to pray for a massive heart attack. I thought if they come 911, takes me to the hospital, I won't have to apologize. But he said, come in before my heart attack. So I go in and I apologize for my unchristian behavior. And then, so that not only brought reconciliation between us, but when there was a problem in the community, he'd come to me, which I was shocked, you know. Yeah. But grace works if you work it, yeah. but you have to work it, and that's step 10. Yeah. We have just a couple minutes. 11 is? <clears throat> 11 is about the life of prayer, and I like the way that AA states it, sought through prayer and meditation to increase our conscious contact with God praying only for the knowledge of his will first and the power to carry it out. So St. Teresa of Alba says, okay, you want to pray? Then start by bringing your will into conformity with God's will. And that's what the person who goes to a 12 step is taught in step 11. To whatever you want, Lord, just give me the grace to do it. Yes. And that's what our prayer is about. But it's not about um, Catholic voodoo. Uh, or controlling God or anything like that. Or like you said, people get angry because God doesn't do their will on earth as it should be in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. The self-centered person prays, the selfless person prays, speak Lord, your servant is listening. That's step 11, speak Lord, your servant is listening. But the self-centered person, when he prays, listen Lord, your servant is praying. Yeah. You know, listen Lord, did you get my petitions? Did you get my intentions? Did you get my novena to St. Jude? We want God to do our will. When St. Teresa says it's to do the will of God, and that's how you're praying, to do God's will. And the last minute, a 12th step. So they realize, the founders of the 12th step, that you have to have an apostolate. You want to get healthy, you got to get out of yourself and go help someone else and live these principles in all your affairs. So somebody can come to a confession and he's, I can, this man keeps coming back, I recognize the voice, he's got a lust problem. I tell him about the 12 steps. Oh, Father, I belong to AA. Well, did you ever hear of the 12th step? Live these principles in all your affairs, not just your alcohol affairs, your sexual affairs, your gambling affairs, your eating affairs, all your affairs. Mm -hmm. And you have to have an apostolate. There's a wonderful book about these two Jesuits who were alcoholics. It's called The Soul of Sponsorship and about how these get into recovery and one priest says to the other, I think we need to do more to stay healthy. We should go to the insane asylums 
and to the jails and help people. There's people that have been misdiagnosed. Well, see, that's, you know, you can see where this all comes out of our Christian faith right. and feeds back into it. It's a great way to chunk down the problems. Right. Father, we're out of time. Would you join me in giving a blessing to our audience? May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and lead you to full sanity and health, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, we can bring you Father Emmerich and all the other shows that he's done, plus all the other programs, because you make this network possible by your gifts. So we ask you, please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay all of our bills too. God bless you, and thank you.